What is happening to you is more important than understanding word for word what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, yeah, I yeah. felt that too. Yeah. So it's assimilating the answer in a different way, rather than. Yeah, sometimes it's not even assimilating. It's just something gets changed. Mm. Something just gets changed, and you cannot say, "Well, well, it was about this, and I understood, and so I got it." Just, you know, you're just you're almost like, you know, sort of vacant, and uh, energetically, some things. Will happen for many people. It's like that. Like that happened for me when I when I sat with Papa G, you know. Yes. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. Yes. I was talking actually. I felt really, really disturbed. <laughs> I very disturbed. I didn't want to understand. It's like uh, it's almost like you are going through an experience that you are just destined mm-hmm. to go through. But you don't have any power at all to do anything about it. Mm. You understand? Mm-hmm. Just you're brought there and you had gone through and something made you write a letter. And your mind is saying, Why did you write this letter? you know? It's <laughs> like you know, it's like, you know, all that's happened is that you've just been brought up here to like a fool, basically. <laughs> 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 but it's already the syringe is in. <laughs> and it's uh Unloading, and uh, there's nothing you can do. You're frying, you know, under your skin. It's very good. It's not very nice. It's very <laughs> mm. It's almost like the people have to be brought beyond their capacity to control, because and even they don't control. But they believe they do. That sometimes things happen that you're out of your capacity. You can't defend yourself. You can't show off your power because you have none. And there's nothing you can do about something. It's a very good place to be, you know, where you're kind of defenseless, helpless. Um, maybe you're overwhelmed. You can say like that. But your whole system receives such a shock that if it was up to you to regroup yourself, you could not do it. But something inside all of that, this pulling apart, this stretching, this implosion, that once you cross, you are fired out of yourself. It's like you are, maybe for the first time, you are kissed by the universe in a place that you cannot comprehend. So everybody else wants to learn. Learning is not a big deal. Learning is okay. You can continue learning and studying, but you have to somehow break open. And people, mind, they don't want to break open. They are afraid what it means to break open. Two things. One, you want to learn your way with so much skill that you can you can enter nirvana at will. And the other one is like I say, being drop kicked by God, as we say, you know. Somehow you don't know anything at all. You're just a mess. <laughs> but that's the best thing that's gonna happen to you. Because uh, you cannot contain yourself. And be free, because as as soon as we register in consciousness as an ego, you're collecting, defending, you're developing strategies to be in this world, and no one is clever enough, skilled enough, experienced enough, as an individual, to do anything, but continue to be foolish. 
in matters of the truth, you know. Yeah, you can be skilled in the world, you know, so smart, so clever, make money, but all of these things are perishable. Everything that you accomplish as a human being is momentary, uh, perishable. You come in this world with nothing. You leave with nothing. All these great pharaohs and all of that conquered kingdoms, empires. When they died, they put all their money in there with them, all their gold. Thousands of years later, people from different countries are digging up their tombs. They haven't spent one penny of that money. They bury food in there with them. Oh, when you're going on your journey, they haven't eaten one grain of rice from that food. They put mirrors in their coffin so they can dress themselves when they wake up. The mirror doesn't carry one trace of memory. So it is not that. Anything that happened in the the world that appears in the mind, they're just like images on a screen. In themselves, they have no life. They only have the breath, the breath of life, and that is breathed into it from the Supreme. They don't have independent life. And when you know that, then you can enjoy the momentary and be free of the fear that without transient things, material things, people cannot conceive that there is a life outside of what they know. But if there was not a life beyond what you know, you could not grow. After all these years you spent studying – what are we doing here, anyway? Studying, enjoying, pursuing, gathering, storing. I mean, what can you actually keep? Memories, but even that sometimes fail. Yeah? So it it really cannot just be about that. It can feel like it's about that, but it cannot be about that. The highest, my God, can you imagine? We don't know who who lives in this body. We don't know. We live in this body, but we don't know what we are in this body. It's like you are presented with a sort of like a a kit, and with the kit somehow you have a small perception of a life based upon identity and the context of conditioning and so on. But shave that off. And initially, people feel completely empty and lost. It's the same emptiness, but because it's wrongly interpreted and owned by the mind, they don't really realize the magnificence, the profundity of their own being. While we have this fear of losing, you never allow yourself to be empty. While you have the fear of losing, you will never allow yourself to be empty. As long as you don't recognize and experience your emptiness, you have no idea what this life is. <laughs> you have no idea what this life is. Most human beings, this life is only precious because of memory. Without memory, who are you? memory. If a day is 24 hours, most people are sleeping 8 hours a day. For 8 hours you have no memory. And those are the 8 hours that you really look forward to, most people, because they don't know how to spend the other 16. There is a other sense still. I cannot shake it off. off. It's mm. Very personal stuff. I'm very sh- ashamed, but it's so strong that it hurts so much. It's like life gives me more and more of this, and I don't know how to move. So 
please just I know that I've already embraced but please be with me now I got you more than you know you know when you are uh, going through some experiences especially when you're coming in it's like the glove is being reversed actually it's like the glove of life is being worn on one side only and spirituality means your something is reversing the glove almost like this and when you reverse it something gets stuck on the other side still when you have experiences like you have which are mundane experiences no because i think you're talking about like something like a relationship or something like this but the it feels 10 times more powerful i told you you're drowning in an ocean and the wave picks you up and carries you to shore and you get up and turn around to thank the wave that saved you and it's gone and you spend your time running around trying to thank this wave it's done its job it's finished it can be like that there's no break but there is inside this experience you're having which can feel like somehow you're having your guts ripped open or something or pulled out huh but something has given you this and whether you realize it or not you know it is going to is going to do something great for you because right now you can bear this although it feels unbearable and all these kind of experiences maybe you've been through them a few times no maybe not you i don't know but people go through many experiences like that and some things are very very painful but you get over them you move on to the next situation or whatever but as soon as you I've come to a place like you have come to you have dedicated your your life your intention your mind to finding the truth but then something arises for you in some experience and somehow because you have a commitment a dedication to truth like i say it feels like the volume is turned up in every direction and is much more intense but you say yes to this fire burn is burning something it's far beyond the little meaning sometimes our minds give it your mind might give it a little a meaning than it really has come for you know and so you say okay you know this is it cry your cry your eyes out scream into a pillow if you're living in a city or something like this go for walks be miserable feel lost everything and breathe it out cry it out sing it out laugh it out whatever it is but don't even be in such a hurry you can't help it you'll be on fire like this but once this finishes you'll be cleansed and you'll probably never go through this type of feeling again in such an intense way because this is not really just about men and women this is some some cleansing some kind of spiritual uh cleansing that happens so it's like this it will it will soon be finished don't dwell don't regret don't long for as much as you're able to some people they cannot help it they just yeah you just want it to finish sometimes you have to come to a place where you just want something to finish you want it to finish you want this feeling to finish it's not about the person no it's just want this feeling to finish and it keeps going on going and say why god why are you giving me all this stuff and i say okay you keep quiet as much as you can because it really feel like this because this cannot just be about a person or about this situation it's not that you are having an intense experience i feel like yeah. it's really somehow it was always easy to say that i just this truth is for me you know and yeah. now just like and now really what? and now what yes they Yeah. But some tries to. Yeah. Tries to. This thing you must beat him. This thing you have to beat him. Because he's trying to find a way, you know, when you defeat the devil in the waking state, then he'll try to attack you in your dream state mm. because <laughs> then your powers have changed. And 
you see, so whatever. But you have the power. And sometimes it's just not a power to, to fight, but to be still and to be empty and to be surrendered to the truth inside your heart and to cook and to know that it's not a punishment, it's just a cleansing. And keep your hands folded and say thank you all the while and know who you are thanking also. It will pass. Everything pass. Just don't try and hold on to anything. Anything that is transient. Anything that is momentary. People think that you can come in this life and you can overcome things and understand the truth by reading books and oh very good. I got that. I write a book myself. Oh look at that. Bestseller. And still you're in hell, you have not come out. Somehow you trust and you work with what is sent to you, what is brought up in you. Stay put, remember, surrender things. Understand that this is just something that has to be burped out. And uh, and, and go through it. Don't ask some for someone to save you from this pain. Take it. Go through it. Even if you feel rejected by somebody, suppose it is like you feel rejected by someone. Don't go to them. Don't expect that they will say, Look, I accept you to stop the pain. No, take your pain. Take your pain. It's your pain. It's not theirs. And they're not responsible for it. There's a lot of blaming, judging. Yeah. Not myself. Towards yourself or not? No. No. <laughs> well, whichever. Also, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, whichever way, whichever way, it it will find w- whatever whatever it can whatever circuit it can find. It will find like this. I yeah. I, I feel like something that wanted, but because uh, it seems like he is giving me more of this suffering with yeah. by his actions. You know? Yeah, but uh, you can see you're wallowing in what is personal. Your river is totally personal here. Mm-hmm. It's just personal. You want to rescue the person in you. You know, it's moments like this when you are faced actually with, you know, really, are you true? Is it the truth you want? Because sometimes, you know, I remember this thing. I told this already. There was one girl coming. She was coming to satsang with me for a while, and. She became so um, deep, surrendered in satsang, that at one point other people were recognizing her, calling her their guru and all that. But she had one strong vasana coming, a fear to be alone. And this fear to be alone is driving her in one relationship after another. She cannot be alone. She has this this romantic idea of finding her prince. I told her you're going to be kissing a lot of frogs, and you're going to turn off prince because this is not your story. Your mind wants this story, like that, and it's going to use this somehow, and it's going to bring a lot of trouble for you. But it's your cooperation. It's your power. It's not something different from you, because the mind is you also. I said to her, you know what? I think if God came right now and says, Darling, come with me. Walk with me. And right then your boyfriend show up and says, Babes, trust me. (laughs) Trust me. I'm with you forever. Where will you go? She couldn't speak. I said, Exactly, you don't know. (laughs) Maybe go with the boyfriend. That's how stupid the mind is. You will go to church and say, Until death do us part. Yes, until death do us part. Sickness and in sickness and help. If you've got no money, even if you've got no money, I would do it. I want to say, because I was contemplating on this today, and not only today, that as I 
I, I, I've been really true. And truth was the only thing that which I really felt <laughs> from many years, like pulled into. And um, there was nothing greater, and also relationships. Like I'm, I'm young, but still something was there going on. At s even now, when I was young, and then stopped, and it was this clear pull into this only. And I came here. This came unexpectedly. I f surrendered to it, to it. And now this question comes because I feel like I'm. There's. If God came to me, I just feel like something is trying to... I don't know where I'm standing in it, but something feels like... I'm not sure if I will follow this God, mm. you know? And I want to expose this, and I want to be clear of myself. Because it always felt like I'm true. And I'm really, you know, you know experiences I had in your presence. In His presence also. But in this presence, and now something like this, make, making me confusing where, where I am, who I am, just want to be. Mm. Yeah. Where I am. So if God came to you and say, you come now with me, and he came and said, listen, listen, I really had a dream that somehow I made a big mistake. I'm here for you all the way. Okay. You have five seconds to decide. Four. Three, yes. Two. One. What? I'm going. Huh? Yeah, I'm following this. God. I'm going. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. You you make a choice inside your heart, that's it. Because you're, you give, you're giving attention to something which is really playing out as pure exaggeration, actually. You must know this thing. This force is holding down nearly seven billion human beings are in prison on the earth. No chains. Can't see any chains. Can't see any bars. Can't see any judges. These silent prisoners. Why? Because until somehow, I, you may say, grace unlocks this your heart from the bondage to the mind, where the beings, the consciousness beings, they believe themselves to be just uh, the body and and mind and conditioning and identity. And no matter how strong they think they are, no matter how powerful we think we are, no matter how independent you think you are, there are some powers you cannot avoid. You cannot pretend. You cannot dismiss. Until one really has really surrendered inside the heart. And the one who surrenders actually can only be consciousness. <laughs> only consciousness can surrender. A person can't surrender. Consciousness surrenders in the form of a person. Grace caused that to happen. <laughs> then you're never really out of a trap if you continue to hold on to somehow. Because, as I said before, the egoic mind, the psychological mind, the function of it in this world somehow is to keep the consciousness fixated upon a material existence, physical existence, emotional existence, psychological existence, <laughs> like that. So really, to break out of that trap is not easy. Almost as say impossible <laughs> if you conceive of yourself only as a human being like that. It's just a good fortune of grace. I said yes only because you brought me to this moment. Yes. And I, because I don't know what is <laughs> the unknown. What is? I don't know. That's you what? say you don't know because you first you don't know who you are. That's why you don't know what the unknown is. You and the unknown are the same thing. You say this because you think you are the known. You think you are the thing that is knowable, but all that appears to be known is just such a 
tiny it can fit in the back of a stamp. We think we know so much about ourselves, but it's only what this world has given you. We cannot converse anymore on the sen- on the basis of logic. On the basis of logic, the life is far too thin. Your life has no miracle, it has no magic, has no splendor, has no beauty. You just end up uh, like a tin of sardines, basically. Open like this, <laughs> drain, pour in a pan, heat up, sandwich, eat. I mean, that's all. The mind uh, of man somehow want to have everything explained, but you cannot explain love. You can explain feeling. You can explain faith. You cannot explain a miracle. You cannot explain existence. You cannot explain consciousness. You cannot explain thought. You cannot explain memory. You cannot explain intellect. You cannot explain time. What it is. We only have ideas. Everything is on ideas about, you know, concepts about. So something has to push you beyond the comfort zone of apparent knowledge. Everybody wants to know enough to be safe. Can you know enough to stop dying? So something has to explode or implode you inside. You have to come somehow, you know, willing to step out of your arrogance. Please won't you take all my Because really, only then does a human being become really available to step out of this shallow shallowness. Because we feel that we are so special, we are so something, but we are nothing actually. <laughs> a few days on earth, fleeting. What is great about this? The Supreme Being is behind it all. And it is a supreme being that is manifesting as us, as me and you, this type of feeling that happens in this body, which is the portrait that consciousness paints of itself in flesh and form and thought. Thought is the palette of consciousness, and it can mix any colour, paint any picture. It's like a picture speaking, a painted picture. Because when we speak, we are consciousness. I mean, without consciousness, how can speak? Even to have identity, you must have consciousness. All this is consciousness. But it is consciousness on a trip. And unless it really wakes up to the truth of itself, it just portrays arrogance and momentariness. So something must soften the heart of human beings. So that we can come with some understanding, some patience, some humility. Humility is the key, actually, that turns the lock of grace open. Not a person can turn it. Someone is open to to just say, "Take me." Not even protect me. Replace me with you. Replace me with the truth. A little courage, even that courage, grace is given. Keep quiet, because when you have said that in your heart, something begins to work, something begins to happen. Just like you mix a bit of yeast in your flour and a bit of water, and you knead it a bit and leave it overnight, something is happening. Even when you are sleeping, something is happening. Washing out all this dead stuff, all this arrogance, all the pride, all the stupidities are completely transformed by this. Blessed are the meek, he says, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. 
認されていますですから。But we're not yet mature enough to feel that. Because many things are hidden, dormant, you know, unrecognizable in the half light of consciousness. You, know. you don't see them, you don't recognize. But they are there at the same time, siphoning off, sucking at your power. But you don't recognize it. But gradually, things happen in life, whether it's someone it happens through, or some experience, or Whatever it is, you know, you fall off your bike or you get fired from your job or whatever happens, you get into a fight or somebody beats you up or whatever. And through these uh, sometimes ugly expressions or something, you, you help you to find your way home. See, the mind wants you to be comfortable, you know, you have enough money that you don't have to ask anybody for something, you have enough independence so you don't have to rely on anyone. And it will try to get your lies, you're growing weaker and weaker and weaker. You think、oh, money. Makes you strong? It doesn't. It isolates you, makes you very weak. Comfort makes you very weak. Aspiring for comfort takes all, saps all your energy. Searching for someone just to love you and tell you, darling, you are so beautiful, is the most wet and weakest feeling. Come into life. You get knocked about a bit, you get dip, dipped in hot oil. It's okay because it stops you from, from just going into another womb again. Another womb, another room, another life. Something, I don't know. It's not so great. It's not so great unless you're awake. When you're awake, everything is fine. Even what you call suffering is fine. You saw something beautiful in everything. When you're asleep, even what is beautiful is not fine. Why? Because your mind is not fine. So, in these t y p e of things, you say, if you can stop the suffering, I've been through this thing, I see what it, it can do, and it can burn. You just, you just don't want to wake up. Because you open your eyes, and this thing is right there. Inside your body, crawling through your cells. But, you know, at a certain point, something changed. Something changed. You just say, you know what? You also sense it's coming to an end. At a certain point, you sense, just like you, you smell the rain is going to fall, and five minutes later, it's falling. You smell the rain. You also smell the, the, end, of, the end of things. They come for a while, they burn fiercely in your life. Why is it that Jesus Christ, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, why is it immediately the Spirit drew him into the wilderness in order to be tested for 40 days, 40 nights, to be hungry, to be alone, to be tired, to be frustrated, to doubt, and to be tested, to be tempted? Why? To overcome these things. Baptize, boom, go to a party, <laughs> you know, Jesus' party with disciples, have a good b a t h r o b No, you go into the desert. You know, where you're alone, you have no friends to call upon. And then you start to feel where your demons live. The mind is trying to hide, hide inside your, your being. So you don't recognize. But things come, and、uh, it's not a person. A person is not strong enough to do this to you. A person is not strong enough to do anything to you. Your mind is stronger than a 10,000 demons. But still, no demon h a v e power over you. They help you to find the truth, to find the thing they cannot defeat. The demons are here to help you to find the things that they cannot defeat. This is the decree of the Supreme. 
that you will see your weaknesses. Of course, you love to take the tablet, of course. Take it away, wash it away, foom. But sometimes you go through things and they make you strong, clean. You, you come out of something that perhaps you might have gone through many times before. But this time, it's like the Olympics of emotion. Of tiredness, of fear, anxiety, doubt, suspicion, superstition, all of these things will come. And what? You're going to get over them. You have to get over them. Keep your eyes open so that when it's finished, you don't go, Oh God, thank you so much that it's finished. No, you say, You know what? Bring it on again. Bring it on again. Can you say something like this? Bring it on again. Out of you good kicks and some licks, but I can take it. Bring it on again. So that I don't feel happy and thanking the mind. Thank you, mind, for being so kind. Don't seek any mercy from your mind. Say, throw your best punch. But I stand with my God. You know, I told you this thing, this saying. Don't say to God, I have a big problem, isn't it? Say to the problem, I have a big God. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was on a place I went to here in the country. I saw something on the wall. Tell me what it says here. And they tell me, Oh, it says, Don't say to God, I have a big problem. Say to the problem, I have a big God. Why are you saying, I have this problem, I have this problem, I want to stop this problem? You have no problem. You are going through some things which you have to go through, and of course there is great pain, and great, uh, and something strongly identifies with the flesh, strongly, strongly, strongly. If it wasn't for the identification with the flesh, nobody would be bound. <laughs> nobody at all. Because the evil one cannot intimidate the Self. It is only when the Self somehow descends into duality and believe itself to be merely personhood then it can come under the this the sway the power of uh, duality and the negative slant of the duality would you like to go through a life with no challenges i give you two parts a life with no challenges everything you want you get everything you want you get Every sweetie you want, you have. Okay. Even you say, "Look, I want to live for a thousand years." Okay, live a thousand years. Or you accept the life you're given and live through it. Which will you choose? Take a little time. I love the story I told you about Alexander the Great. You remember the story? Yeah. You know the story I told you about Alexander the Great? Yeah. I want to tell my daughter she's not heard it. it says that Alexander the Great, right? He was like a great a great fighter. But he had a very very strong belief that there was this nectar, this amrit the nectar of immortality, that if you eat this or drink this nectar, you will never die. He had a very strong, strong belief in this thing. And then he sent many, many people on journeys all over the world, even in those days, before aeroplanes, sail on ships and go to many, many lands to go and try and find. In those days, the world was a much more mystical place, to try and find this nectar of immortality. And all these people travelled all over the world, and they brought back all kinds of different things, aloe vera and all different type of stuff. He said, "No, none of these things. It's not it. It's not it. It's not it, guys. Come on, you know, ginseng and all. No, it's not it. It's not it. This thing here is going to make you live forever." So then somebody told him that there was a place he could go, but he himself had to go. He himself, in order to find that. So he himself travelled a very, very, very long way. 
for many, many, many months in the sea, arrive in this place, in this country, and travel again many, 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 many weeks. Then he finally got to a place, and the man told him, What you are searching for is up there in that cave. And he could look, and he could see, up on the rocks, way, way up, there was a little hole. And he was so fired up, he was so full of belief and inspiration. He climbed up there, climb, climb, climb with that, climb up. When he got there, it was a, it was a cave, and he walked into the cave, and it was quite deep. He goes right deep inside the cave, and as he was going in, it was very, very dark at first. Then he saw a little shining, like, like shimmering light, like golden honey color light, <gasps> going deeper, deeper, deeper inside, and then he reached this place inside. And there was this thing dripping from the ceiling like honey, and it was so the luster from it was like gold shining like whoa, shimmering, and he felt in his heart, "This is it, this is it, this is what I'm searching for, and he couldn't wait, so he rushed up and he dipped his finger in it, and it was just to eat it now, as he got here, something says, "Stop, a voice says, "Stop, he goes." <gasps> Hello, 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 hello. Who is there? Who is, who is, who is there? Nothing answered. But he said, I know I heard his voice. And his heart is trembling. But he was so strongly craving for this taste. He goes again to take. And the voice says, No, stop. And now he knew that it was not just in his head. He said, huh? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Looking. He had a little torchness looking inside there. And then he saw in the corner, he saw his one black bird, like a raven, sitting in the corner, looking very old and full of cobwebs, you know? And he's kind of move his wings, there's all some feathers missing and everything, sitting there. He says, Oh, what are you? And the raven says, Don't, don't take it. Says, what is this? Like a bird that speaks, you know? He said, Don't, don't take it. Don't eat it, because I wasn't like you. I came here, also searching for this nectar, and I've been here for thousands of years. I ate this nectar. I can't die. I want to die. I can't die. My feathers are falling off. I feel sick. I'm tired. I have no friends. I have nobody I know. I've outlived everyone. I can't die. Please don't take this. Then it says that Alexander the Great was touched by this vision that he saw, and he left this place, came out. He says, "Okay, I don't take it." So finally, came into his mind. I'm searching for immortality, but it's not this type of immortality. Not the immortality of the flesh, but the immortality of being. If you think yourself to be just flesh and blood, you think that life should be just flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is not life. It's like a time bomb, like a candle burning away. And this body one day, the fire will burn it, or the worms will eat it, or something will take it. But nothing can. You cannot bury a fire. Cannot destroy a fire. So when you talk, sometimes I hear people talk, and they talk like you. I talk like you also, but these are foolish things. These are foolish things, momentary things. But still, you are going through it, and it's like it's like ten times louder for you, and you must burn, and you must take your burning a bit. But don't say, don't curse God for this burning. Thank God for this burning. Because what it takes from you, it will replace with something immeasurable. It's your good fortune. But most people they don't know how to appreciate their own good fortune. We are saying thank you to things which are perishable. 
But what is imperishable we take for granted. You don't even know it. Don't know it. This is why human beings must first of all know who they are. Because you can pursue many things and die without knowing who you are. But if you know who you are, you can never die. This is why I tell you, the Master cannot die. Only the Mister can die. When they speak about these things, you know, mind, body and spirit, all these apparent layers are inside us. All this world, all this universe is inside us. Not physical. The world of the universe is not even physical. It is not beyond us in terms of just in terms of subtlety, subtlety of knowledge. Not physically necessarily like somehow small things to talk about. Most people cannot comprehend this type of knowledge because they need a mind to assimilate. We cannot assimilate these things. Because everything is going on, your breath is going on, thought is going on, feelings are going on. But all of them are re- everything is read, everything is readable, everything is perceivable. Everything is momentary. You are the one that sees them, perceives them, qualifies their importance. But yourself can you see? What I have discovered destroys knowledge. Destroy phenomenal knowledge. Replaces it with spiritual knowledge, which you may call like that truth. Let's say truth, even more than spiritual knowledge. I have a little place for understanding and for some sort of merciful feelings, like what you experience you know, a bit. But I cannot give too much to that. Everybody must feel their pain. Everybody must take their ounce of pain. Like I say, it's it's your tax for having a life. You must feel some pain, take some strain, but in that consciousness somehow become more refined, more deeper, more broad. Not intense. Consciousness does not need to be intense. Intensity is a measurement for the mind. Consciousness is simply perfect. You see. All these things you come because you wanted to experience. We all want to experience. Experience is the salary of spiritual existence. Everybody wants experience. But that which experience experience. Let us try and come to know that thing. And if you want to get access to these things, honour God. That power alone alone gives everything. Grants the wishes of men, momentary though they are. Years ago, when I was, was I had this opportunity to work as a teacher in art, teaching art in college, no? and I could not uh, really approach it so much. Although I had a lot of experience with understanding color and movement, and it's like it's too much. It's too much. How can you teach this thing? You have to make a method. You have to you have to systemize it in some way to teach. I found it very very difficult to do that. So people want to show how do you draw this and how do you draw that. I said, this is how it starts. You know, how do, how how do you do this to make it look so real as well? And I said, you know what? Don't worry about that. Okay, just feel the thing first. Just feel it. You know, feel it inside your heart. You know? I was trying to get them to feel something. <laughs> feel it. I mean, you can draw any foolishness, okay? But just feel it first. Feel it. Yeah, because we used to go and talk before we have a class, and want to talk a little bit, and then they get very inspired. So they get very inspired, and they produce stuff from themselves that they they're just surprised, you know, like man, you know, it's just they just they get they lost themselves in it. <laughs> we have a place in my town called Folly, in Jamaica. It's called folly. It wasn't always called folly, but what happened was that a rich man came to my town, and he met a local girl and he fell in love with her. She was very beautiful. Not so long ago, he met this beautiful woman, 
and he really loved her. Now he fell in love, but she didn't love him. But he had a lot of money and uh, you know wealth, and uh, so you know they came together somehow, and she married him. And then he wanted to make a sort of like you know like some a beautiful home for them, like it's Taj Mahal, you know, or something. So he commissioned this the architect to make a beautiful building. And then he wanted to make it at the outskirt of the town. There's a little kind of peninsula that goes out into the sea like this. And there's a little island off it called Monkey Island. You can walk when the when the tide is down, you can walk across to the, the small island. And he made this monument to this girl. You know? But what happened is the guys who came to make the building, right, there was no fresh water. So they used salt water. <laughs> And they made this building, and it was—it really was beautiful. You know, I never saw it new. But what happened is that, you know, she could not, she could not return his love. You understand? Mm-hmm. And in the end, so the love began to just fall, fall away, decay, and then the building started to decay as well. You know. And even now, this building is in my town. It's called Folly. You know, I didn't know what Folly meant. I never knew. I just thought that folly was up just a place, but it means that I miss a mis- mistake. The relationship was a mistake, and the bloody house was a mistake. Okay. <laughs> so, but the place is beautiful. It's like a haunted building, you know, just by the sea. And it's we have no building in my town like this, with such romance. Even now, there's a romance in the in the place. And a lot of some mystical Rasta people go and live there and draw all kind of funny things and there's no roof and there's a there's a big banyan tree outside and out of the centre of the banyan tree a huge palm tree is growing up again <laughs> like this. Amazing. On top of the banyan tree, a coconut sprouted and then growing on top of this big banyan tree going up into the sky like this. <laughs> and so I went into this place when I went back and really looked at it. I was so much in love. I took some beautiful photos of the place. When I came back, I went to cut my students together and said, "Listen, I will tell you a story." I told them the story about this place, and they were like this. You know, they were like, "Whoa!" They were really into it. I said, "I want to show you these photos." I took there and I showed these photographs, put them up on the board, and looked at them, and they looked at it and they looked, and you know. And I says, okay, you know, what do you feel about all of this? Just, just be present with it, you know. Be feel it. No? And then I want to leave you. I'll leave you for a while, and you guys think about it, what you want to do. And they made the most incredible. These are sometimes it's like some kids that came to to school for A level art, and they they make some amazing things with feeling and depth and something mystical, not just charcoal and paper. Something beautiful with feeling because they. Feel it, you know. In the same way we talk about these things, you have to feel them inside your heart. You have to feel the truth. When you feel it, then you sometimes your mouth can't speak what your heart feels. Then you are sort of like pregnant with spirit. And when people speak to you and speak only words that are dry, that come from books or come from someone else's idea, you know immediately these words are not alive. They have no life in them. They are just the words that come out of encyclopedias and dictionaries and thesauruses and other people's magazines and stuff. They haven't really been transformed through your own living vibration, your own, your own sensitiveness, your own sensuality. It hasn't been touched, you see. And like this, having come to that understanding, I just feel like the whole of this bloody life, if you don't know who you are, it's a waste of bloody time. It's a waste of time. What you're doing here, counting money, that's going to turn to dust. Money is not personal. The things we talk about, they have got to go through the bloodstream of your being itself. So, 
so that how are you going to talk about these things? This this perfume has to come out, ooze out through your your pores. You're not going to know how. But you'll be alive. A life that death can't steal, can't touch. All my life I look at things and people tell you things. Nothing can compare. Nothing can compare with one kiss from God. One kiss from God and I walked out of my life. I had the courage had the inspiration, had the power. Once a woman came to Satsang and she said, I used to be, have a lot of opinions about so many things in life, but since I've been coming to Satsang, I don't know nothing at all. She said, well, What happened? How it happened like this? I said, All I can tell you is that if you're walking down the road and somebody come up, with your little dog, a chihuahua bite you. A chihuahua bite you, and you are so angry, you want to take the person to court, you want to have the little dog put down, you will never get in this depressed kind of they end up troubles from you. That's how it will be. But if a lion bite you, who are you going to complain to? Which court are you going to go? <coughs> so I said, the satsang lion bite you. And when you get bite like that, you become very quiet. <laughs> you see, you make a lot of noise when a chihuahua bites you. But when a lion bites you, you'll be very quiet. <laughs> very quiet. Just to make sure it will hear you and bite you again. <laughs> It is true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs>